Welcome to Real Physics. You know, I really appreciate these large language models, but this today is a little bit of frustrating debate about quarks because it's obvious that these models still parrot a lot of silism. You know that I'm very skeptical of particle physics. This is my book about the well, about particle physics, and I don't want the model to be too agreeable. So a little bit I had I invited that kind of stubbornness in my prompt you can read here. I'd like to dis discuss fundamental physics and focus on quarks. I'm very skeptical and so on. I would like to review the evidence for quarks, but I told him my prompt, okay, you should see that as a debate because otherwise you get also overwhelmed by this wealth of detail, which is not useful. But at the end, yeah, it turns out to be frustrating. Ready, let's open with the originals. Gelman's two-page proposal, 1964, and Zweig's ACES CERN preprints, then go straight to the first hard evidence. The slack deep in elastic data showing scaling and point-like constituents inside the proton. Yeah, I know that quarks have been proposed by Gelman and Zweig. Let's dive into the evidence. Can you break down the content of the 1969 Physical Review Letters paper? What does it say exactly? I suppose you have just read it, by, I, but I upload it anyway. And I should give a little bit of context here because this experiment is about what well, it should prove the existence of quarks, whatever that is. But we are talking about deep inelastic scattering. That means you have a proton and you have an electron crashing into that proton. And well, the usual scattering is just elastic scattering. That means it gets somehow deflected as in Rutherford's historical experiments. And you can measure then the angles and so forth and, and maybe the cross-section. But this is entirely different. Deep inelastic scattering means inelastic, means you're producing new particles. And in this case, it's a mass of new particles which are going to be created. And well, then what do you do with the results? And you know, I think he gave a pretty decent summary about that paper. Here's the paper, the two figures. And I, th I think he gave a de decent summary, but it becomes evident that particle physics is unable to express its results in normal language. So this is still a lot of jargon. He says, okay, we have electron proton scattering. This is the energy. Then we have the angles and then you have the structure function. And then he says, okay, you have Birkin's variable. So I asked him for a general audience, please explain what this means and tell me about the two models. And then, well, he tries to explain, but evidently you still have to use all this language and says, okay, this is the debris of the proton and you have the four momentum. The four momentum, okay, is something that is transferred by the electron during the collision. And then I asked about the two models, what we are talking about here. And it seems that they have one model and another model. And well, one model is more compatible with the data. But what does that mean, you know? At the very end, we want to prove the existence of these constituents of the proton. Three constituents, quarks with a certain charge, two thirds and minus one third, but it's not specific. You have just one model here with the vague idea of point-like particle and another model. And they're setting up all these kind of arbitrary quantities. I mean, things like this Birkin's omega, there is nothing fundamental about that. That's a statistical number you invent to try to make some sense out of this variety of particles coming out from the collision. Nobody understands how many particles, what particles, but what you try to do is just a rough summary. By the way, if you like the approach in this discussion, share it with friends and talk about with people who might benefit from the message because it's this kind of recommendation that helps to increase the audience of the channel. Yeah, so the discussion goes on. I said, can you expand on what means scaling in this context using again intuitive language? The part model seems to assume tiny charged constituents, but how many is this reflected by the data that we have three quarks or five or one or what? Scaling. When you plot the proton's kickback, all the spectra at different angles and energies ride the same curve once you're in the deep region. The response stops caring about the absolute beam energy or Q squared. How many constituents? The cross section only counts charge squared weight, not heads. VW2 measures a charge squared weighted density of scatterers, 
So Diaz fixes the total charge squared budget, but not an integer count. Its overall size matches models with point-like charges to within a factor two, consistent with a few fractional charges, but not uniquely determining the number. Yeah, that's evidently not an explanation. So I said, please break down again the scaling behavior in a more intuitive form and explain why this speaks in favor of point-like charges. In the second statement, you're trying to say that the cross-section is determined by the charge, right? This is not exactly surprising, I guess. Because, of course, all what happens depends on the charge. I mean, what else is an electron? It's charge. Yeah, again, the answer is a little bit frustrating. I don't read it in its entirety. He talks about scaling and the point like charges and the resolution and the fall off and the Q squared and the cross sections. And it's a little bit frustrating by, because I admit I kind of lost the debate in the sense that he overhelmed me a little bit with all this detail and particle physics would then come around and say, oh, you just don't understand particle physics because you're not an expert here. But you know, you don't have to be an ichthyologist to know when a fish stinks. So it's clear that all these quantities are not really fundamental. I mean, we have fundamental quantities in physics, which are energy, momentum, angular momentum, and so on. But he actually doesn't answer the questions why I should believe that these vague statistical patterns in a mess of an experimental results speak somehow in favor of the existence of quarks. So I said, okay, let's try to come back to the bigger picture. You have one model, part of model, vaguely inspired by the idea of point like particles, so an undefined number of these, and the results are more consistent with it than with another model, which is not too well justified either. Isn't it a little bit exaggerated to call this evidence for quarks? Not exaggerated, just precise. Uh, the 1969 SLAC data are direct evidence that the proton contains point-like charge scatterers because the response scales and falls like 1q squared instead of showing any finite size, which extended blobs would. What turns partons into quarks is the rapid pileup of independent counting tests. Neutrino DIS isolates the valence piece, F3, and nails spin half-charge constituents. The E plus E quinines 2 hadrons ratio, RS, rises in discrete steps exactly as the sum of quark charge squares when new flavors open. And three jet events reveal the gluon that ties them. One paper shows point-like charges inside. The ensemble shows fractionally charged quarks with a gauge field. That's evidence. Cumulative, over-constrained, and hard for any epicycle to face. So here is the methodologic problem. You take a very complicated model, the quark model, and you have six different quarks and three different colors at the very end and a lot of complication. And you take out one very primitive aspect of it, which is even an assumption, a point like charge in a quark. You're just imagining, oh, this quark could have point like charges. And then you compare it to another model saying that, okay, my model performs better than the other model that assumes that the proton is not a point like charge, but a distributed charge. But we don't know anything about the charge distribution of quarks and protons in the first place. It's all an assumption. So in plain words, you have, you assume that the proton has a distributed charge and you assume that the quarks have a point like charge, which is completely arbitrary. And then you compare the models and one model that with the point like charges wins, but that's not evidence for quarks. That's a straw man argument. And the result of this experiment is that we don't know what the heck is happening. And well, then he proposed other so-called evidence, but I said, well, keeping the focus on the 1969 paper, I wonder if there were genuine predictions. David Lindley, here is his book. I love the, his comments and he's very to the point here. He says, the standard wisdom at the time was that the mass of debris created by inelastic scattering was too complex to be understood in a way that would shed light on the inner structure if there were any of the proton. Inelastic scattering was considered as highly speculative, at best a waste of beam time, at worst. But they did it anyway, <laughs> no matter if the experiment makes any sense or not. And Lindley continues to comment, inelastic scattering produced as expected a complex mass of new particles and Kendall, Friedman and Taylor showed that the statistical properties of this mass behaved in a relatively simple way at higher energies. 
This still seems an appropriate description of what had happened to me. But he said, mm -mm. Yes, there were real prior predictions, and the paper set out to test them. <laughs> First, Bjork and scaling. If true, VW2 from different energies' angles should collapse to one curve. From that collapse, they infer sigma t propped to 1 hop q squared at fixed omega, the hallmark of scattering on localized charges, not extended blobs. They also confront a detailed vector dominance prediction. A parameter tied to longitudinal via transverse p proton scattering should not depend on q2. And so on and so forth. But here's the thing that completely destroys all of what they call evidence because we just don't know how highly accelerated charges lose energy. So I said, well, I think all this hinges on the assumption we have understood the scattering mechanism of point particles to begin with, right? That implies one could predict the radiation of an arbitrarily accelerated charge, say a sigma, depending on the acceleration on the two uh, spatial angles and the wavelength and sigma would be a wavelength dependent intensity of radiation coming out from that accelerated charge because we know accelerated charges radiate but not exactly how and here is his answer you're aiming at the wrong target death isn't radiation from an arbitrarily accelerated charge it's one virtual photon exchange off the proton to the left hand side fixed by qd and the hadron side encoded in w12 inclusive cross sections like these are infrared safe Soft collinear photon effects cancel when you sum over unresolved radiation, block Norsiak, Kinoshita Lee Nauenberg. So you don't need a general sigma vec A, theta, lambda to trust the result. Experimentally, they normalize by the mock mock cross section, analyze in terms of W2, W1, and R complex sigma T, and at the small angles used, extract VW2 with little sensitivity to R. The striking feature is the weak extra Q2 dependence in the collapse to a universal curve in omega. Radiative effects were corrected for in the SLAC program with standard QED treatments. They don't mimic the observed one Q squared like fall off or the scaling. So the evidence here is not, we don't know radiation but see a pattern. Its QED controls the probe, cancellations tame radiation, and the data reveal point like scatterers inside the proton. No, I mean, it's abundantly clear that we don't understand how highly accelerated charges behave. And what else could be a process with a highly accelerated or decelerated charge if not that kind of high energy collision? So you don't understand this process. And he says, no, 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 we understand it. It's a one photon exchange. So I say, I saw your impressive search for an answer as a sideline. I think that indicates that the problem is far from solved. You're assuming that there is one virtual photon exchange and then the result is consistent with that. That's a circular argument. I'm just saying that we do not know how charges behave under huge accelerations. This is related to the unsolved problem of self energy and acknowledged for example, in the Feynman Lectures, chapter 28, and Landau Lifshitz, paragraph 75, they clearly state it's an unsolved problem. You're right that classical radiation reaction is murky, but that's not the lever arm here. In DIS, the probe dynamics are QED and tested. The cross section factorizes in one virtual photon exchange with calculable radiative corrections, mozai, that experiments apply and that don't produce the observed universal VW2 omega collapse. We don't know accelerated charges. Worry is neutralized by KLM block Nordsig. For inclusive observables like DAS, all soft collinear photon pathologies cancel, so you don't need a general sigma math theta phi lambda to trust the result. Meanwhile, your authorities are about classical self, not the quantum inclusive regime used here. Empirically, the same scaling shows up with muon and neutrino probes. Different couplings, same internal point like hit. So it isn't an epicycle of electron radiation modeling. So here is Feynman saying that the problem does not go away when you introduce the quantum, right? And well, he, he comes up with all these Mozai, KLN, Bloch, Nordzig. Honestly, I don't know what the fuck all this means, but I know for sure we don't have the general formula. So we don't understand highly accelerated charges. So you just can't come along and say, no, 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 we understand this. That's precisely this smug arrogance that let fundamental physics into the mess we observe today. Well, to be fair, I invited him a little bit to be not agreeable and conduct the discussion like a debate on stage. Okay, but still, it's disappointing. Meanwhile, your authorities are about. And while that's hilarious, he calls Landau and Feynman my authorities as if I would invoke authority to, to make my argument. 
I'm the one challenging the authorities, fine men in this case, because I believe that QED is bunk, but this is still another issue. In general, I think it's a problem. You know, I, I really think these models have a potential, but there is a danger that they are kind of trapped in this geek world of sialism. And well, we have to think about the danger of useless knowledge in fundamental physics to get to the very bottom of explanations. Well, this discussion was a little bit frustrating. I have made another video in which I addressed more the methodological problems, but it's a bit lengthy and with audio problems, but you might want to watch it. And well, there's still a lot of work to do with these models. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like it. And if you're interested in fundamental physics, subscribe to this channel.